Okay, hello YouTube. Uh, this is going to be my episode 7 and 8 review of The Mandalorian. And I'm also going to talk a bit about season 1 overall. Um, and just kind of give a summary of some of the things I liked, some of the things I didn't like, and some of the things I'm looking forward to uh, going towards uh, season 2. Um, but I will start with this. Um, I said in my episodes 4, 5, and 6 review that if I... That for season one to have what I thought was a good finale, it needed to be a two-part episode, and that's exactly what we got. And episode seven, episode seven was mostly set up. It was mostly set up for the big two-part episode that we were going to get, and then episode eight is all the payoff that you got from episode seven. So episode seven is pretty slow for an episode, at least at first. You get to the uh, the, the tense like scene at the... Uh, at the uh, Imperial hideout. And right as that's about to kick into like all the action is what episode seven cuts. So episode seven is an individual episode. It was okay. Uh, there is, um, there are a couple things I like and it's one thing in particular that I definitely didn't like. Um, so let's start with that. So a couple of things I liked about uh, episode seven was the kind of the, the, the bringing back together of all of Mando's crew, or not all of it, because he doesn't, like, get back together with, like, the characters from episode six, but you get to have Cara Dune come back, Gina Carano, um, you get to have Carl Weathers come back, um, I still don't remember his name, but it's only mentioned once, like, Moss Grifa or something, and then, um, you get to have, uh, the, the droid, the IG droid and Quill, uh, come back as well. Um, now, I did not expect the IG droid to play such a huge part in uh, the upcoming episode, but you definitely see to have him come back. Uh, it creates kind of a little dynamic because Mandalorian hates droids so much. Um, and then you've got... Uh, so you have them all come back together to go back to where we began and where we were on the same planet that we were on for episode uh, Navarro, I think it is. I think that's the name of the planet. Um, we have uh, them going back to Navarro with... Um, where we had episode one and where we had episode three, uh, the the callback is to the the covert Mandalorian uh, cell that's underneath the city, uh, but it's obviously a trap. And like right at the very beginning of the episode, even I even said it. I'm like, well, this is obviously a trap. I wonder where. I wonder how he's gonna get out of this one. So we get there. We go down to the planet. Oh, they have this like negotiation on the outskirts with Carl Weathers where. He makes it pretty obvious that, like, yeah, this is going to be a trap, but I'm stuck in this trap, too, so I'm looking for a way to get out of this. And uh, they have this scene where they're camping out before they ride into town at at, uh, at dawn. You know, again, very Western, very Western. And they get attacked by all of these flying... Um, uh, var um, I can't remember the name of the, uh, the, the, the creature, but they're the same type of creature that attacked Han's ship in uh, the the asteroid field. So I guess these Minoc, there we go, Minoc. So I guess Minoc are just like an inter an interstellar like pest because they're all over the place. And because they're you can find them inside of asteroids, you can find them on swamps, like there's some Minoc on Dagobah, you can find them like you can find them everywhere. So the Minoc attack their camp their campsite and uh, you get Mando gets hurt as part of this fight, and so does a couple of, and so do a couple of the other people, and then Yoda breaks out the Force healing. Now I got a lot of problems with Force healing. Um, first of all, Force healing is even if it does exist, it's supposed to be a dark side power, or at least that's the way that Emperor Palpatine explained it to Anakin in Episode Three. Now, Palpatine is uh, is obviously a unreliable narrator, so he could have been lying, but even if uh, force power, even if force healing was a light side force power, or, you know what, maybe it could still be a dark side force power, because uh, Yoda has been demonstrated, baby Yoda has been demonstrated already at this point in the show to be capable of using dark side force power when he choked out Kara Dune, I forgot to mention that, where, like, why is he, for why is he force choking Kara Dune? That's never even touched on later, so it's almost like they only do that just to show that Baby Yoda can use dark side force power. Um, but I just don't like the idea of force healing in general. I know they, and they, they, this is such an obvious tie in with Rise of Skywalker because force healing plays such a huge part 
in that movie for developing the plot along. But I don't like I I didn't want this type of get out of jail all your wounds are are healed power brought into Star Wars because I've seen it used so many times in other medium like anime as a get out of jail free card. You know, it's it's like a Deus Ex Machina for like it it makes all the stakes in the show not really feel as impactful. So I'm not as big uh, on I don't I don't like this power just as like just as a power that is in like the story. I, I don't think it's I don't think it does a lot of good things for the story. Um, so then we have them. He, uh, Mando Mando gets healed, and the, so then it's not even mentioned again. Like, no, like I think Mando I think Mando might have been the only person that might have seen it. Like that might have seen Baby Yoda using this power. I'm not really sure. It's not really that whole scene is like blink and you'll miss it. Like I only remember it because it was brought back up in some of the other discussions that I've seen about it. But whatever. So we get the we get the team riding into. The town there's like stormtroopers on the outskirts there's a ton of stormtroopers on the inside and let me just say uh you know before uh, this season started uh, i had seen online about how dave filoni and john favreau had hired the 501st fan club because they didn't have enough costumes for the number of stormtroopers they wanted to show in in the scenes for the for the last episode for these last two episodes and i mean Shout out to the 501st Fan Legion because you guys looked good. You guys looked good. It was really cool to see that many stormtroopers as extras. Not CGI stormtroopers, but just extras in the scene. And even if all you had to do was stand there and point your blaster at something, I mean, they looked imposing. It was cool to see that many stormtroopers like on screen at the same time. Um, it was also cool to see the Imperial Transport the, uh, the hover transport be brought out. That was something I had only ever seen in Star Wars Rebels before. I know there's some toys for it, but it was something we hadn't seen in the movies, and it was a nice callback for that. So they go in and they meet uh, the the Imperial agent that started the whole thing for them, and we and there's this tense scene where, like, I, I don't understand why the Imperials just didn't want to, like, see the, the child before he was even brought in. You know, like, Imperial incompetence, it plays a role in the other episode, too. Um, but then we get the big reveal of the big villain, the villain that's behind everything, and it's this guy, Moff Greedon, or Moff Greedton, Moff Greed, or something. He comes down in this TIE fighter that's got these folding wings as part of its, uh, as part of its landing configuration, and he proceeds to open fire on the whole hideout, killing stormtroopers inside. And the scene, the the episode ends with him, them in this like big tent standoff at the outside of this episode, at the outside of the uh, the hideout. And so episode eight kicks off right after that. And episode eight doesn't. Oh, but but before I get there, then uh, Mando's trying to call Queel on the the comm link, and Queel's like riding riding hard trying to get back to the ship trying to keep baby yoda out of the hands of the imperials and he gets gunned down by two scout troopers on speeder bikes and that's where the episode ends so the ep episode eight picks up and right at the very beginning of this episode you get some really really awesome and hilarious banter between the two scout troopers and I, the entire time, I'm just sitting there, I'm laughing at these two grunts that are just, you know, in the middle of, like, this bureaucratic mess that is the Empire. This inefficient bureaucratic mess. They're, like, bantering back and forth with one another. The, like, the one uh, scout trooper really wants to take a look at Baby Yoda. The other one won't let him. Uh, you get this thing over the intercom about how he, uh, Moff greeting like, uh, gunned down a squad of troopers as soon as he landed so now the two now the two scouts are all like well we better do this exactly by the book because we don't want to get shot either kind of makes you wonder why these guys are even in the empire in the first place but it's a, it's such an awesome scene of just two grunts two scout troopers just being in the army together not really knowing what's going on not asking questions just caught up in everything and then these two scout troopers that you start to identify with a little bit get beat to death by the by ig-11 that comes rolling through to save baby yoda and then you get this really cool kind of ridiculous in a star wars way but in a good star wars way you get ig-11 on a speeder bike rolling through this town and he's just blasting like 
back, like turning his body every which way, just like blasting all these stormtroopers at full speed, the kind of thing that would be completely impossible if he was anything other than a Jedi, if he was a humanoid. But as a droid, kind of makes sense. Kind of makes you wonder, like, why there's the Empire just didn't have an army of these IG-11 droids. But the 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 makers of them are very. It's like a guild. It's a carefully guarded guild secret. It's why they have to self destruct so they're never actually uh, salvaged and put back together. But you get this. You get this outlaw on a horse charging through town, guns blazing, like very Western style. Uh, droid coming to the rescue. Uh, or at least he's trying to come to the rescue of our three trapped heroes inside of the hideout. But there's too many stormtroopers. So a gun battle in- ensues on the outside of this hideout. Uh, this, the stormtroopers had been setting up this big, uh, what this big uh, like rapid fire machine gun laser, and they're just gonna like blow the entire. It's like an EV heavy laser or something. It's gonna, they're going to blow the entire hideout to smithereens with them inside if they don't come out and surrender. Now, initially, I was like, well, how come they just don't do that in the first place? I mean, all of their scouts, all of their guys inside are dead. Why don't they just lay waste to this hideout? And then Mando figures it out. He's like, oh, it's because he, he doesn't have uh, the child yet, so he still needs us. And initially that wasn't quite clear it was kind of like to me i was thinking well why don't the imperials just kill them now when they have the opportunity you know this is a little too unbelievable in terms of being incompetent but then that happens so you get the they're setting it up they're like sieging the outside of this hideout ig11 rolls in starts blasting every drive drawing a lot of stormtrooper attention away so then our heroes start trying to break out and again there's too many stormtroopers they have a really cool awesome gun battle it harkens back to the very first episode where the mandalorian like takes over the big rapid fire laser and starts mowing people down but he gets critically wounded when the moff shows back up and blasts the uh doesn't try to blast him in the best guard because that's obviously not working so he blasts the power generator for the big laser which sends a big explosion and man is critically hurt so even though it was like it looked like our guys are just going to escape because ig 11s a badass and comes rolling through town. Actually, no, they're still stuck. They took out a lot of stormtroopers along the way, but they're still stuck. Um, also, it was kind of cool to see how the death the, the death troopers, the ones in the black, uh, how they were still definitely a cut above the rest of the regular stormtroopers in white. Uh, they were able to engage in hand-to-hand combat with Mando. Also, if you guys had seen my previous videos about uh, the use of the weapons inside Mando's toolkit, I haven't always been a fan of the way that he uses all the weapons in his toolkit. And in this gun battle, he just doesn't use any of them. So I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, but um, at least I'm not seeing him using flamethrowers on armor anymore. So at least, you know, props to that. So they get back inside. Mando's critically hurt. And we get uh, this scene where he's going back and forth with Cara Dune. Cara Dune, who really doesn't want to be captured, doesn't want to leave him behind either. It's not really necessarily clear what her motivations are. I mean, she does barely know him, but she has a she demonstrates that she has a clear like concern for Mando and doesn't want to leave him here. Um, so then you also get this flashback about how Ma- uh, the Mandalorian isn't necessarily Mandalorian because he's from Mandalore, but because he was a foundling, and they finally explain what a foundling is, which is not something that you've really heard in previous uh, lore about Mandalore. Um, They're basically refugees that were taken in and raised by uh, Mandalorian warriors. So he's not necessarily from Mandalore, but he's adopted the Creed. And because his, uh, it it gives you again, this is pretty obvious if you've been paying attention, but it gives you again, like his big reason for why he doesn't like droids, because he saw droids massacre his entire home. So, uh, there's this big, there's this back and forth thing about, no, you should leave me, I'm not going to leave you. It's pretty cliche, but eventually uh, the IG unit, who again is the big savior of this whole episode, he uh, convinces Cara Dune to leave so that he can, um, he can guard Mando. He uses a back to spray on it, which is again, it's a get out of jail free card, but at least this one like has been established, back to sprays are a thing in, uh, in Star Wars lore. So I was okay with that. 
And clearly, we weren't going to let our main character die right here. That would have been a huge plot twist. That would have been Game of Thrones Season 1 with Ned Stark. <laughs> I didn't think that was going to happen. But we also got to see underneath the mask for a quick bit. We got to see Pedro Pascal, who, looking good as always, all bloodied up and all beaten up. Uh, we get to see him, uh, finally, after so long. We also get to hear his name, and it's completely stripping my... It's been completely, like, skipping my mind. It's like... Uh, Jara June or something, or Dune Jara. I think it, that that might actually be his name is Dune Jara. Anyway, I'm gonna keep still gonna call him Mando because he's the Mandalorian, and that's just easier for me. Um, but we get we also get an instance of uh, Baby Yoda using his Force powers again to stop this big flamethrower from incinerating uh, them inside the hideout. Which again, speaking about flamethrowers, this is becoming a common theme for me with this show. Uh, that's how you use a flamethrower. That's what flamethrowers are for. That's why they were invented. They were there to flush people out. People, not droids, people. They were invented to uh, flush people out of an enclosed, fortified space because you don't want to send guys in there because that's suicidal. So you use this flamethrower, you can shoot them from the outside, it covers the whole thing, and it it's essentially smokes people out of a hideout. That's exactly what a flamethrower is supposed to be used for. And it would have been pretty effective if it wasn't for the magic of the force stopping all the flames from actually incinerating everybody. So, also a good scene. They make their escape through the sewers. Uh, there's this thing, there's this cute little bit with the, uh, the, R, the R unit, the R unit droid that's kind of like a fairy. And you can't really tell if it's programmed because it's leading them into a trap or it's just, you told me to go to the, the flats, the lava flats, so that's where I'm going. So you get this scene where they're going out of this, it's kind of unbelievable, but it's also a hovercraft. It's unbelievable just at a, at a limit to where you're like, okay, you know, I'm still okay with it. But it's like this running river of lava and they're on a boat. I mean, <laughs> I, this is like at the limit of how much I'm going to be like, okay, but that's, that kind of looks a little ridiculous, but I'm, I'm going to run with it. Um, they get to the outside of this... Uh, of this opening where the river, the underground river becomes like an actual like lava river and there's a platoon of stormtroopers there. And so this is where IG-11, who, who I was just really getting to like know and love, sacrifices himself with the, uh, the thermal detonator that was revealed at the very first episode, so it was a nice callback, to take out this platoon of stormtroopers so our guys can get away. And they're almost gonna get away uh, before Moff Greeton comes by with his TIE fighter and starts, um, starts strafing them. Um, but before we get there, uh, there's a scene I skipped where we get to, uh, they're making their way to where, like, out of the, the underground, the sewers to this underground river, and they come across the, uh, the base where the Mandalorians were, the whole covert. And that's where we meet our armorer again. She gives another exposition dump to, uh, the Creed and why the, the Mandalorian now needs to take care of Baby Yoda. I mean, the scene is kind of cool, but it's like... That scene was just really an exposition dump. It was an exposition dump in the middle of, like, a bunch of action scenes. It kind of feels out of pace just a little bit, but it still works, and you do get our Mandalorian being equipped with his jetpack, finally, uh, which is, again, something I said at the very beginning. I'm like, okay, he doesn't have all the gear yet. He doesn't have the jetpack. We're going to get the jetpack later because we need to have a sense of power scaling in order to keep things interesting. So he gets his jetpack, but he's not allowed to use it yet because he doesn't know how. Um, so after uh, IG-11 sacrifices himself to take out the uh, the platoon of stormtroopers, uh, Mando equips his jetpack to take on the TIE fighter. And that was pretty sweet. That was pretty sick. Um, I've, seen, uh, I've seen Mandalorian troopers attacking ships before in um, Star Wars Rebels and in Clone Wars. So this is something that like has been established is like even though it looks pretty crazy that you can actually attack starships with a jetpack, it's been established before that you could do this. Uh, so you get this cool scene of him using the jetpack to um, he gets close to the Tie Fighter as it's going by. Um, he uses his grapple hook to latch onto it. It sticks two detonators onto the side, which causes the Tie Fighter to spin out of control and crash. Now, I was thinking, if I was these guys, I'd go and check the wreckage just to make sure this dude's dead. 
but that's too predictable for TV. So instead, we have to leave the big fad to be revealed to be alive. I knew he was going to be alive at the end of the, at the end of the episode. I didn't expect the last cliffhanger though to be to be there. So we get to the we get to the the end where it's just uh, Mando now knows that his mission is to take Baby Yoda to to be with his other species, which gives us a big question of like. Wait, so how many more of them are there? Are there actually a planet of Yodas out there? Or are they, as I thought they were, like an endangered species that there's not very many of these left across the stars? So that's unclear, but that's going to be explored again in season two. And then uh, Cara Dune gets left behind. I really wanted her to continue accompanying Mando because I like the dynamic that those two have with each other. She stays behind with Carl Weathers to become a new uh, bounty hunter type slash mercenary on Navarro. Because he has big respect for how good she is in a gunfight. Although, to be perfectly honest, in this particular episode, she doesn't really do much aside from lay down cover fire. That's kind of like the only thing she does in this whole episode in terms of her being like an action hero. Um, so, for as much buildup as we got to like, oh, this, uh, this Republic shock trooper is supposed to be a real badass, she doesn't really do all that much to justify that description in this episode. Kind of a small negative. So then Mando's taking off, he's going to, he's riding off to the sunset, and then we get, though, just prior to the credits, we get a cut to the crash TIE fighter, where I'm like, oh, they're just going to show that this dude's alive. And we get Jawas on the outside, or picking pieces apart from the from the, the TIE fighter to go hawk, and then you get this lightsaber sound, where I'm like, wait, a lightsaber? Like, it, that's what it sounds like, or is using some t- sort of torch, and then the blade pops through the TIE fighter, and I'm like... Holy shit, that's the Darksaber. Where the hell did he get the Darksaber from? Um, and I say the Darksaber because there's only one Darksaber. And if you guys don't know why this is tripping me up, you guys gotta go watch Clone Wars. You guys gotta go watch Star Wars Rebels now. Because this little item that he's holding in his hands is a big deal. It's a big deal. Now, the thing is, is that this Darksaber, the Darksaber's been lost uh, since we don't know what's happened to it since Satine Wren had it before the uh, the start of A New Hope. So Satine Wren had it, and then she gave it to uh, Duchess Satine's sister on Mandalore to unite the Mandalorians. And then there's this big gap of the entire original trilogy, uh, including when Mandalore clearly like had a purge and a couple of other different things. So we have no idea where this Darksaber's been, but it's really significant that this character has it. So this is a big, big cliffhanger to, to end on. It, it brings up all these questions of, like, I was wondering why the Empire wanted Baby Yoda to begin with. Um, th- this dude's got the Darksaber. Yeah, it might it might make sense that he is, like, someone who's more familiar with Force lore and more familiar with uh, the magic of the Jedi and the history of Mandalore than clearly the other characters are in the show because most of the other characters don't even realize, don't even know who Jedi are. So... That's a big deal. That's a big deal that this that this guy's got the dark saber, and it left me with a big like yearning for season two. Because now I'm sitting here going like, okay, I had um, overall. Now we're getting into the end of the season uh, discussion, or my thoughts on the rest of, on the the season overall. Even though I thought this season uh, had some some smaller like uh, you know nitpicks that I could make about it, even though I didn't like necessarily everything that this season did. Um, the way that the season closed out, both with the overall, both overall, the way the episode uh, went, but the specifically the way that that that, that cliffhanger, it really makes me want to see it, uh, season two because it really, like, I really want to know how this dark saber plays into everything and where we're gonna go with Baby Yoda. So, um, this season, um, the way that it ended, a plus. A plus. This was ex- this is a season finale. That's a season finale, folks. That's how you do a season finale. The action was amazing. The way that they did the side characters is really cool. We get to see more of the development for our mysterious protagonist. Uh, you get plenty of um, you get plenty of dialogue and interactions with other side characters. Uh, the the way that they're doing things with the stormtroopers and making them feel human it feels very Dave Filoni. And the way that he made the clone troopers feel human and legit 
in the Clone Wars, the the banter with the Stormtroopers and Rebels. This is par for the course for him. And I'm really happy that we're getting to see more of that in the live action because this is something that the other Star Wars movies, even the original trilogy, don't do all that well. Um, so then we've got... So the ending is good, but there were some issues I had with it. Um, I liked kind of the idea of how we were going to have multiple different directors coming in and giving their uh, their take on like what an episode of Star Wars would look like. But by the time that we're done with uh by the time that we're done with this whole season oh well, i got some thunder going on outside it's pretty loud um by the time that we're done with this season there are some clear winners in the who's going to direct more of the mandalorian going forward uh the obvious one is first off is danny chow she was the uh director for episode seven she was the director for the very good episode three um she was awesome and then also we had um uh, dave filoni who I think is more one out of two or one and a half out of two, because episode five was okay. Um, I don't necessarily think he was the weak part of episode five. I just think episode five felt kind of filler and very skippable. But he also was the director for the opening episode, which is another one of my favorite ones. Like the episode eight, uh, episode three, and episode one are probably my three favorite episodes. Um, episode eight is probably the best one. And then we got the director for episode eight, who I can't remember his name exactly. Um, I can't remember his name exactly. I'm going to just look it up real quick. Uh, it's like, it's, it's, a uh, it's a hard name to pronounce. Um, Taika Watiti. Taika Waititi. Um, I'm saying that name wrong, but like, yeah, apparently other people knew about him a lot better than I did because apparently that humor with the scout troopers at the very beginning is very typical of his work. I don't know much about his work. He's a, he's an unknown to me, but after this episode, this one episode enough is, is enough for me to say, oh yes, he's definitely going to be directing more episodes of the Mandalorian and I want to be seeing more of him. A lot more of those three. And absolutely no Rian Johnson <laughs> going forward to uh, more of uh, more of this series. Uh, John Favreau also is like I mean we all know how good John Favreau is now. It seems like everything he touches turns to gold. He was the uh, he was behind the first Iron Man movie. He's doing this now. Um, John Favreau, Dave Filoni, Danny Chow. We we found people. Disney, Lucasfilm. We found our team. These are, these are people that clearly understand Star Wars, that clearly know what they're doing, uh, that clearly know how to respect the lore, respect the characters, and also develop and create new stuff. So I love, I love what these people have done with this series overall. Um, I, I feel like a lot of the lessons that we could take away from this first season are very easily learned lessons. Um, the pacing was a little bit off, we had those first, the, those middle three episodes that had nothing to do with the main plot and felt very filler. And also, I, I, I know I'm not alone in saying this, but having 44 minute episodes like Star Trek and like the later seasons and like the later episodes of this season are much preferred to having to wait a whole week just for a 30 minute episode. So if we can do 44 minute episodes from here on out, yes, let's do that. And then if we could have, um, if we could if we could limit the number of new directors just doing their unique takes going forward to like a couple you know per season i mean i know we only had a couple this time around but you know I, if we could keep if we can keep that formula going in the future i think the show has the potential to be very interesting and add a lot to um the star wars universe going forward from here um i just kind of I know this is I know this is a pipe dream, but I, I want them to completely stop referencing the sequel movies because um, I, I I just want them to stop I I want them to stop being reminded that those movies are out there, but overall um, this season this this show uh, I give it my full endorsement. Uh, I was really hoping that this series was good, so I had some Star Wars content that I could look forward to in the future, and I got it. And now I'm on board. So I'm on board with The Mandalorian. I'm looking forward to season two. Um, and I'm I, the future is bright for Star Wars as long as these people are given more creative control 
and less creative control <laughs> is given to some of the people that I that I haven't liked, whose work I haven't liked since Disney's taken over. But these guys, this whole crew, um, Johnny Favreau and Dave Filoni and everybody that they seem to bring in, the, the, these guys know what they're doing and I'm looking forward to see more of their work. So that's my review for episode seven, eight, and my overall thoughts on season one. Um, if you guys like what I'm doing here, uh, give me a, a, a subscribe, hit that subscribe button, give me a like, leave some commentary on things I could do better if you guys don't know. I've, I've been introducing backgrounds and stuff too. I'm trying to do more stuff with OBS to uh, make these uh, videos a little bit more than just me talking into a webcam. So I'm, lo I'm working on that. I'm trying to do more, but um, I just haven't been fiddling with the program as much as I should be. But um, I still haven't seen Rise of Skywalker yet. I'm uh, looking. I'm going to do that eventually. You know, when I get around to it. I'm just not very excited to see that movie before I can make my complete review of it, knowing so much of what goes on inside of it. But that will eventually happen at some point. So uh, look out for that in the future. And until then, this is KT Vindicare.